When you start Dark Souls, you begin in the Undead Asylum. It's a very simple place, there's lots of messages on the floor telling you the controls, how to equip weapons and such, but it doesn't really tell you how to play. The first few enemies are fairly easy to take care of. Swing the sword at the right time, block at the right time, make it up to the boss, run away, etc. You know how this goes. Now, while this is a very comprehensive way of teaching the player the controls, it isn't very good at instructing them on how to really play the game. A few minutes later, you're taken to Firelink Shrine. There are a number of paths you can go from here, but the quote-unquote intended way is up these stairs here toward the Undead Burg. And here we approach the titular cliff. This, to me, is one of the finest tutorials that I've ever seen in a game, and what makes it better, relative to the actual tutorial in the Asylum, is that it's completely unnoticeable, yet completely unmissable. So we approach the cliff and are immediately confronted by two enemies. One is close with a weaker weapon, the other is further away with a stronger one. If you approach the first one, he can be quickly dispatched, but as you head for the stronger one at the back, a third enemy drops down. This here is the first lesson. Awareness. The player should now know to look around for enemies that could enter the fray unexpectedly and from any direction, including above. The approach toward the cliff gives you a good view of everything you're about to fight, and the prepared player will generally prevail. After dispatching the new foe, the player will usually have moved toward the shielded enemy in the back. From the Asylum, we learnt that enemies with strong shields can be taken down easily with a parry or by throwing them off balance, but once again, an unexpected obstacle. From above, another enemy is throwing firebombs down at you, presumably while you're fighting this guy. With inexperienced players, this will often cause a panic. They've been hit by the firebomb, and then the enemy that they were fighting in front of them, and suddenly they've lost all of their hit points and control of the situation. The lesson here is... Dark Souls is unfair. At the first approach to every new area, the odds are always tilted against you. And it's unfair. The first time around. And maybe the second time as well. But then you start to strategize. That bomb guy up there always kills me. Do I take him out first and keep him out of the picture? Or do I just back out of his range and bait the others toward me? Does my build permit me to take him out at range, or do I have to brute force it? And then you find a strategy that works. It could take one attempt, or two, or seven, or thirty, but once you find the way that works for you, you can push those scales back into your favor, and make the game fair. Having this mindset and going through every new area like this will take you through the entire game, and eventually, you might get to a point where you get it on your first try every time. Further up the cliff, there are a few more enemies to contend with. The firebomb thrower, plus two others. The bomb guy will continue to throw them at you, even as you approach close, making for an easy kill if you can get in between animations. But, if you aren't careful up here, the two remaining enemies can go in for an easy pincer kill, or push you off the cliff. Now most of the enemies you've fought up until this point have had either swords or daggers. Relatively fast swinging weapons, with a quick follow up but low damage. If the player has been practicing and they have parry reposted every enemy up until this point, there's one undead up here that can throw them off completely. He's carrying an axe. The axe has a very different swing animation to the sword, with a much longer wind up and shorter follow through time. Due to this, the parry window is different from the sword. Not by a significant margin, but different enough to throw off the cocky player. And this is another quick little lesson in engaging enemies with care, especially if the enemy, or in this case, their weapon, is unfamiliar. Another unavoidably important aspect of the cliff is the cliff itself. While some players prefer to tank incoming damage using a shield or heavy armor, rolling away and avoiding the damage altogether is a core mechanic, and thus highly encouraged. However, if the player isn't careful, or doesn't mind their positioning, especially when locked onto an enemy, one bry tap of the dodge button could send you hurtling off a cliff, down a hole, or into a hitherto unexplored or enemy infested hole. The cliff itself connects to an aqueduct, which will take the player to the next area. But below the aqueduct, along its foundations, is a tantalizing item, just out of reach. After managing, or ignoring, the enemies, and mastering the jump, which is thankfully not a core mechanic, the player is rewarded with this special ring. Ironically, the ring breaks when the player dies, and the jump back is far tougher than the jump here. Eh, live and learn. There are more rings of sacrifice in the game. The Cliff is a far better tutorial than The Undead Asylum, not just by teaching us how to play, but also what to expect. The Asylum really is just a series of corridors separated by the occasional open space or fog door. 
There are helpful messages on the ground every 10 steps telling you exactly what to do and where to go. This is rarely, if ever, the case in the rest of the game. Corridor segments are few and far between, as are helpful notes, and the player is usually left completely directionless, sans a few words from an NPC or the vague inclination to reach the end of the area. In short, the cliff is a scaled down version of nearly every area the player will go to in Dark Souls. It gives players a small sandbox to practice in, and teaches them some of the fundamentals of what to expect on the road ahead, while at the same time being only a short distance from the nearest bonfire, allowing both the quick recovery of lost souls and a very short downtime before another attempt can be made. While enhanced and altered as the game progresses, these rules will follow you all the way from the Undead Asylum down to the Kiln of the First Flame. The opening segments to a game are by far the most important, but also the most difficult to design. You only have a short period of time to grab the player's attention artistically, narratively, and mechanically. As mentioned, Dark Souls does this nearly perfectly, perhaps stumbling a little in the narrative category, but all around, Dark Souls is one of the strongest openings to a game I've yet seen. To put it in contrast, let's examine a bad opening area of another game, Bloodborne. Now, artistically and narratively, Bloodborne is perfect, but the opening 20 to 30 minutes from a gameplay point of view are kind of rough. Bloodborne begins similarly enough to Dark Souls, a little story, character creation, and off you go. It deviates almost immediately in that the first enemy you see is intended to kill you to send you off to the Hunter's Dream. Now, Demon Souls also does this, and while this is just my opinion on the matter, I think that immediately killing the player and then dumping them in a mysterious place they've never seen before without any context or direction is a poor decision. I understand that the intent is to say, yeah, nerd, this game is hard and you're gonna die a lot, but Dark Souls was able to skirt around this quite elegantly. The broken sword you start with does decent damage to enemies, but next to no damage against the boss, leaving you with no other option but to run, which is the correct response. Dark Souls instead says, yeah, nerd, this is going to be tough, but there's more to explore, so why don't we do that before we get to the boss? Maybe we'll find some new weapons, yeah? Instead, with Bloodborne, we take two steps back and give the player their first dose of discouragement right after starting. Now, where it differs from Demon Souls is that you grab a weapon from the Hunter's Dream and immediately drop back into the clinic and kill the monster that killed you. This, all things considered, isn't a massive discouragement, but instead of pitting you against a few weaker enemies that you might be able to best, you're thrown against one large one that new players have nary a chance in hell of actually killing. But anyway, we move on. Climb the ladder, light the bonfire, and head toward Bloodborne's Cliff. This main street of Yharnam is where the player is tutorialized. This is Bloodborne's Cliff. From the bonfire, we can head right and tackle a few enemies. They come one at a time, different weapons, and one even has a shield. So far, so good. Down the stairs, and there are two ways we can go. To the left is back the way you came. You can open a shortcut gate, but you have to get past these four enemies here. One with a shield, one with a pitchfork, one with an axe, and one with a cleaver. All of them have fairly distinct behaviours and ways to counter them, but as soon as you approach, they begin to rush you down. Now, no one strategy is going to fell all foes, at least in the early game. The pitchfork enemy can attack you from a longer range than your melee weapon can reach, if it is untricked and the axe and cleaver enemies do some really solid damage to you. Bloodborne's rally mechanic encourages players to immediately retaliate against attacks, as this can recover health taken by enemies. The more you hit, the more health returned. The greater chance you'll stagger your opponent to get even more hits. However, the encounter with these four enemies makes that very difficult, as each enemy has a different range and attack speed, a new player can get absolutely churned by these four, which makes retreating the only logical option completely antithetical to one of Bloodborne's core mechanics. Now, this situation does occur a few times throughout the game, but generally in much more open spaces. Backstepping and circling around enemies is a great way to give yourself some breathing room and break up groups like these that have different strategies to take each enemy down. But this tactic isn't viable here due to the narrow choke of the street. Now, players have been taught that backstepping and dodging is the quickest and safest way out of a tough spot and this is a tactic they will often default to when things get hairy. Quite the same as Dark Souls, being unaware of your surroundings and dodging around can lead to some pretty catastrophic consequences. Doing so in Bloodborne is not only dangerous, but it's refusing to engage with a primary game mechanic, and actively making the game less fun by taking it slow and steady. 
As we move in the other direction, some offshoots of the street become available, with the occasional hidden enemy and an item to find. But as the player approaches this courtyard, they are greeted with possibly the worst designed enemy encounter in the whole series. More than 10 enemies with pitchforks, axes, shields, guns, and dogs. All this in just a heap around this bonfire. This is what happens if you try to take them head on. These early parts of the game are supposed to be tutorials, microcosms or snapshots of things to come with escalating circumstances as you progress. This is just showing the new player, hey, here's a bunch of crap that's a pain in the ass to deal with. If you get too close, the gun guy will shoot you, the dog will chip away at your health incessantly until you die, and three different enemy types with different attack speeds will all run you down. This is what you should expect from now on. The only option for the inexperienced player is to either run up the side and take out these two, then run back down the middle for these guys, then run past all these guys to kill the gunner, or slowly bait them out of range and just run back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, slowly but surely taking out all the enemies with no risk and no fun. This is how most new players will approach the situation. I know several people who heard the call of Bloodborne 10 out of 10, best game ever made, and have given up at this part right here, and they're not alone. It's my belief that a lot of the gatekeepy status of these games stems from situations like these, where it seems that the game itself is saying, well, if you can't get past the opening, then you don't deserve the rest of the game. After this little hiccup, however, Bloodborne reclaims its 10 out of 10 status and doesn't stop kicking ass until the final boss. It's just this first area that teaches you to do all the things that the larger game just does not want you to do. Now this isn't a direct comparison between these two games, it's just two methods of approaching the same problem, and why one makes for a better new player experience than others. There are plenty of games out there that have their own cliffs, and other ways of secretly teaching the player. The best part is you've probably run them a hundred times and didn't even know it. Thanks for watching.